We start with the January 6th committee releasing more new witness transcripts, revealing stunning new details from inside the Trump White House. More from the star witness, White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson, who told the committee her then boss, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, would burn documents. Liz Cheney asking Hutchinson, did you ever see Mr. Meadows burn documents in his fireplace? Hutchison replying, quote, yes, maybe a dozen times, emphasizing, quote, he, as in Mark Meadows, would put more logs on the fireplace to keep it burning throughout the day. And that between two and four times, he had had Mr. Perry in his office right before discussing the vice president's role on January 6th. That is damning testimony for Mark Meadows. Burning documents in his office fireplace during the transition period? This new revelation will certainly get the attention of the Department of Justice. More on that in a moment. Hutchinson also telling the 1-6 committee she remembers Meadows, quote, having a meeting with the outer oval saying, let's keep some meetings close hold. Close hold, meaning let's keep those meetings off the books so no one knows. Hutchinson testified there were certain things that had potentially been left off the Oval Office diary. Hutchinson also testifying that her first lawyer, Stefan Pasatino, who was paid by a Trump PAC, told her, quote, the committee doesn't know what you can and can't recall, so we want to be able to use that as much as we can, unless you really, really remember something very clearly. She elaborated, quote, in my mind, this whole time, I felt this moral struggle. Hutchinson ultimately obtaining new counsel and doing the right thing, speaking truthfully and openly to the committee. Her testimony critical in helping the committee piece together their roadmap, improving Trump's intent. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. And a shocking new piece of evidence we also learned in these transcripts. Hutchinson wasn't the only White House staffer seeking legal advice. Former Labor Secretary Eugene asked none other than former Attorney General Bill Barr what he should do after the insurrection. Barr telling him, quote, if I were you, I'd resign, get out of there. And these new transcripts revealing how Trump himself was considering blanket pardons for not only the insurrectionists, but for White House staff. Now there's a growing body of evidence about the extent to which many in Mr. Trump's orbit were seeking pardons after the 2021 attack on the US Capitol. As Ari likes to say, pardons are for criminals and if accepted, an admission of guilt. Joining me now is Hugo Lowell, political investigations reporter for The Guardian, and Emily Bazelon, legal writer for The New York Times Magazine. Hugo and Emily, so great to have you guys here this evening. Hugo, I'm going to start with you. How big is this new testimony on Mark Meadows burning documents and concealing meetings? No, I think it's really big. We had reported previously that we knew how Cassie Hutchinson had testified to the committee that Mark Meadows was burning documents. And the committee doesn't seem like they're really able to establish what the documents were or kind of the contents of the documents. But circumstantial evidence uh, suggests that it was pretty bad. I mean, if you have uh, the, the leader, now leader of the House Freedom Caucus, Scott Perry, uh, in your office while you are burning these documents, which, by the way, he could have put in burn bags marked for destruction if he really needed to. You know, that just suggests there's a level of wrongdoing here, a potential obstruction of justice that I think the Justice Department will look very closely at. Emily, we talk about consciousness of guilt, things that people do that show that they've got a guilty mind. What is your legal takeaway from these new transcripts that have just been released? I mean, burning documents is one of the more suggestive, incriminating things you can do. It suggests you have much to hide. And when you combine this with Hutchinson's testimony that Meadows was saying there should be meetings that were taking place off the books, I mean, you really are drawing a picture of people who are planning things or discussing or plotting things they don't want other people to know about. It's just hard not to read it that way.
Hugo, there is a newly released interview transcript with former White House press secretary Judson Deere, within which he says, quote, beginning sometime around mid to late December, the president discovered that for the first time, my understanding, we released a public schedule of his to the public. Now, he wanted to change the way we did that. And so what became the new version of the public schedule was basically a couple of sentences about what his day would consist of. With the timing of that, Hugo, mid to late December, what does that tell us about Trump's intent in those weeks leading up to January 6th? Well, first, can I just say the fact that Trump only realized four years into his administration that his schedule was public is, is quite extraordinary in and of itself. But I think the timing, as you say, is also uh, problematic for Trump and his advisors, because well, if, you, if you think back to November, December 2020, what was going on? You know, he was taking these meetings, especially in mid to late de December, with members of Congress and with January 6th rally organizers later in January. You know, there are key moments in the lead up to January 6th, whether it's the December uh, 18 uh, meeting with Rudy Giuliani uh, and, you know, Michael Flynn and um, kind of the other kooky lawyers like Sidney Powell when they're trying to dis discuss seizing the burning machines. And then you get to the uh, December 21 meeting with the members of Congress and with Pence and Trump about trying to obstruct uh, the certification on January 6. You know, the fact that these meetings were starting to be kept off the books, you know, again, suggests there is a level of consciousness of wrongdoing. They know there's a consciousness of kind of intent here that if it came out would look extremely bad. And I think this kind of speaks to how everyone around Trump and potentially Trump himself knew what they were doing was potentially unlawful, even illegal. And that was the motivation for trying to keep you know, what was otherwise public meetings and what he, did, he clearly didn't mind previously, suddenly now a real big secret. And Emily, to Hugo's point about knowing what's going on, knowing that it's potentially illegal, let's turn to that blanket pardon debate. Trump molded over, pushed for it, but White House counsel Pat Cipollone rejected it. Cipollone also rejected Trump's idea that all White House staff should receive a pardon. Trump reportedly saying, quote, well, just so they can't go after them for any little thing. And Cipollone saying in response, yeah, but no one here has done anything wrong. Now, I mean, Emily, that might be uh, up for debate if nobody did anything wrong there. And I guess more thanks to Pat Cipollone for his counsel on this one. But doesn't this just further fuel the fire when it comes to Trump's criminal intent? Why pardon anyone or anything if nothing was done wrong? I mean, Trump's lawyers will argue in defense if this becomes an issue in court that he was just acting preventatively, that, you know, he's someone who liked to use his the power of the presidency in unorthodox ways. This is just one more example of that. He was doing a favor on the off chance that there was any potential for criminal liability. And I think your question will still be a good one, whether that's really a believable explanation for this idea of a blanket pardon. You know, Hugo Cassidy Hutchinson also testifying that QAnon was brought up often in meetings, saying, quote, I remember Marjorie Taylor Greene bringing QAnon up several times, though, in the presence of the president privately with Mark. I remember Mark having a few conversations, too, about more specific to QAnon stuff and more about the ideas that they had with the election. Hugo, the close proximity of QAnon to the Oval Office. I mean, it's not even proximity, it's in the Oval. What does this tell us about how it's no longer considered to be fringe? You know, Trump has been playing around with right-wing conspiracy theories and QAnon for some time, but I think it really did ramp up in this post-election period. I mean, if you go back to his tweets and the kinds of things he was retweeting, and, you know, this was stuff that we looked at early in the January 6th investigation as, you know, was this indicative of Trump actually endorsing them or was this things that he just came across and wasn't exactly sure what to do with. But it does seem that these fringe conspiracy theories that he was retweeting uh, in December 2020 have now morphed and metastasized into something that he knows about and is actively pushing. I mean, we, we have been to rallies recently where they are playing QAnon uh, affiliate associated music. I mean, he knows the signs that the white supremacists make, that the QAnon uh, supporters make, and he kind of plays into that. And he's always been about trying to figure out where his base is. And as his base becomes more and more kind of conspiratorial, he has moved and shifted to that space as well. So I think this is a gradual progression that really started, though, 
in the in the lead up to January 6 and has only uh, metastasized in, in the months and years since. Emily Bazelon and Hugo Lowell, my thanks to you for starting off our show tonight. Happy holidays and always happy to see you both.